Um, are the friendships that you developed while you were overseas different than any ones that you've had here? Oh, those friendships overseas were different, yes, in, in sense. Jeff and I are good friends. We play golf together and we're good friends aside from that. The people we met with over there are good friends, but we, we were involved in the same battle. And by being so, it, it, it's, it gives you a closer relationship. And um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I've never heard the same story that I lived here about people in, uh, that were in the Japanese area. The people, the POWs that I be with at the v, VA, you know, they suffered much, much more than I did. I got just, there we're down to two of them now. They walked, what was it? They walked miles and miles and miles and spent, spent days and days and days uh, inside of a, inside of a hold of a ship being shipped back to Japan. These were the guys uh, in Bataan? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm just a little guy compared to the guy that was captured at Bataan as far as uh, being a prisoner is concerned. But I had a tough time too, and my buddies had a tough time. We just, we got gobbled up, and the Germans had no food. They weren't starving us to death on purpose, they just didn't have a lot of food. What did you eat? What did we eat? I can't remember exactly. Okay. Yeah. But they didn't feed you. No, mostly soup, you soup. know, but what? Uh, and the Red Cross packages, you hear about Red Cross packages in some camps. I met with buddies, the, the, the one day now I met with the buddies at the VA. Um, they got their Red Cross packages. Uh, the, the guys in the Air Force that were shot down early, uh, while they were in a camp, they were, they were being deprived of the privilege of being free, uh, but they suffered too. Uh, but they, they were fed. He, uh, I talked to those guys, they were fed well. They were getting their nice Red Cross packages and stuff during that time. But you got to remember the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the Germans had beat down; they had already been beaten down to a pulp. They had lost in Africa. They, they had; they were being beaten. And um, the Margot tells me horror stories about how she survived as a young girl. Uh, she lost her mother in a bombing raid, her favorite puppy, her father was killed on a troop train. Uh, there's some sad stories connected with World War II. And um, uh, psychologically, they get to everybody, me and her and, and everybody else that was a POW or even a soldier that fought in the war. So, as, you, as they always say, war is no fun, and it isn't any fun. Okay. You say war is no fun, and it isn't any fun, and I'll agree with that, but did you have some good times? Oh, well, yeah, we had good times in camps and with buddies, you know. Uh, I'm not saying you were deprived of your freedom because we were in a free country, but uh, we were drafted. We didn't volunteer. Mm -hmm. Maybe that made a little mental difference. But uh, if you said, how did it affect you? I can't remember how it affected me. I, I, I enjoyed my time in the service in the sense that I was... I was active. I was, you know, I was a healthy guy. I played four years of basketball. I, nothing bothered me. I could go on a 25-mile hike and not be bothered. And uh, so I was physically, uh, physically fit for to go into the service. Uh, mentally, it might have been a different question. <laughs> this is uh, probably one of my last questions here. Um, does the world feel like it was a smaller place than it was in 1944? Very much so. To me, it does. Maybe not to some guys. But I've had a lot of good experiences since the war. I've been on, I've been on ham, I've been on uh, ham radio for years and years. I've made contacts with people overseas. I've corresponded with, corresponded with people all around the world. Uh, no, I've had a good time since the war. Are you still a ham radio operator? Oh, I still have my license. Okay. K9. K9 GN. Where's the I guy? saw that up here somewhere. Yeah. Right. K9 GN. I was, there it is. I was, <coughs> I, I was on, uh, I, I, uh, Morris Cove. I, I, I did, let's see, where's the key? 
There's a key up here somewhere. No. I, oh, here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this. Like the radio, like the railroad guy. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I worked, uh, I, did, you, I got it up here someplace. I worked 253 countries around the world on code. Wow. Yeah. Do you still communicate um, email and using the computer? Do you still communicate that way? Do you communicate? Oh, I, yeah. When I, I got into my, I have two sons who have docking. And I got into computers in, I think, 1987. Might have been before that. And I know I've been heavy on computers. So, okay, yeah. so you moved, do you think there was a transition from the ham radio to the... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. To the computers, right? I still got all my radio equipment at some place. But, uh, um, no, the internet is fantastic. <laughs> That's why we're here right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Uh -huh. As you know, I've got a home page, and that's where my diary is. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Kinsella, you've been here today listening about his experiences. And um, how do they compare to your experiences when you were over in Vietnam? I know you enlisted. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of your experiences and, and the, the stories that you tell, for starters. I think that was... Um, there's just so many other places that, that I could go with some of them, but um, the one thing that, that struck me was, what did, I, what did I ask you to remember about? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, hey, you forgot. guys are worse than me. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, I think it had to do with uh, the perception of the people at home. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. It, there, was, there was an entirely different uh, um, persona of the, the people at home. Um, when I came back than it was when, I think it was when you did. Um, when you came back, you were welcomed back with open arms and... and yeah, no question about it. Okay. You're on track. Uh, your guys got treated awful after the, after the, the after fact. And you're talking about your, your experience with the uh, American Legion, um, that it was not a, not a good experience. No, I mean you walk up, you walk. I'm here. I am. I'm dressed up. I go into the American Legion. I want to meet with somebody that had been in the war, and some jerk comes up and says, "Oh, you're the bastards that let the Germans through mm -hmm. the line. What, what, what would you do?" Exactly. That that was that was what you he can't haul off and hit him. You can't haul off and hit him in the jaw. <laughs> uh, Did you think you wanted to? No. 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 He just. To me, I. To me, uh, he was just a jerk. You know, uh, why did they have to do that? But you had been removed actually from from active combat for some time before before you were even brought back to the states, right? I mean, in your POW existence, while it was intense, was different than it would have been if you were you were actually in combat, actually fighting somebody. Yeah, I guess. Okay, I'm not quite following you what you want. Okay. Um, where I'm going to is that in, in, in the Vietnam experience, you would be in the field shooting at somebody one day, and then you would be back in the United States, and while somebody was aggressive to you, you could not shoot at them. Okay. In Vietnam, you would have. Just It, it was a foregone conclusion. Oh, yeah. you okay. You didn't experience anything no. like that. No. Okay. That was, that was really where I was trying to come oh, from. Was there, was, we, we how do you feel? We came home. Um, if I can, I never thought much about it. But we came home, went back to work, and uh, I had I had married while I was in the army. Well, I had a son, ten months old when I was liberated. Um, and we came back and went to work. That's what it amounted to. And, uh, Did you marry when you were in boot camp before you I went married, home? I married. I uh, married Betty, my wife, my war wife. Uh, we married right after I got out of basic training. And before now, you went to Europe? No. I came home on a furlough and we got married. And okay. I was, you know, what, 18, 19 years old. Okay. Yeah. And that was a pretty common occurrence yeah. at that time, wasn't it? Yeah. I had, I had a, I had, you know, I had a baby, I had a, I had a son while I was in prison camp. And uh, I came home to a 10-month-old son. 
Was there any uh, communication between you and your wife while you were in prison? No. So she the only was. The thing was her. She got my. She got. Uh, as, as you can see it in the diary, some some of my Red Cross, uh, my postcards mm -hmm. from prison came. So. so she knew you were alive. Oh yeah, they knew. They knew I was alive. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And then, of course, when I got liberated, uh, they gave me the privilege to call home, uh, or to, to write home. Mm -hmm. First, sent a telegram, and that's in my, it's in the data that you, you it's, it's yeah, in there. And uh, back then, you didn't send words, you sent numbers, one, two, five, six. So I sent my wife, one, two, five, six. That meant I'm, I'm free and healthy, and I'm looking forward to seeing okay. you. <laughs> Okay, I get yeah. it. Yeah. Um, when you got when you got home and and you reunited with your uh, uh, your family, mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming your wife and your parents. Mm -hmm. What was their reaction? Oh, they were happy. I remember I remember flying home and my first trip home. I had to take a bus from Indianapolis, Indiana to Terre Haute, probably 75 miles. Getting off of the bus, I lived 10 miles north of the bus line. I practically ran home. <laughs> practically ran, you know. Okay. And uh, my wife, my new baby, and my mother and father lived together then. So that was happy day. Okay. Yeah. Did, did they ever tell you about the experiences that they had? Uh, for example, did they find out, how did they find out that you were a POW? Telegrams. Okay, and what was their reaction to the telegrams? Well, and they were happy to see that I was a prisoner. They were happy to see I was alive. They didn't know whether I was dead or alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, you know, again, I could sit here and talk to you and listen to you for forever <clears throat> here. Are, are there any particular stories that, uh, that jump out at you right off the bat? No, not really, no. Okay. Um, how about once you first got into um, into Europe, and were you assigned immediately to a to an online position? Well, we were in England, went across the Channel to La Havre, shipped up from La Havre. We were put into a a holding camp. Or we slept in our pup tent. A staging area. Well, we were, we were we we ended up going to St. Beth. That was our 106 Infantry Division headquarters. But we slept in the woods, in the snow, underneath the fir trees in, in our pup tents. And then, then uh, they were then we were ready to go be pull up go pull up on the lines. And uh, we were we were on the lines on the, we were in the area called the Snake Eiffel. Snow mountains, and our positions were across the top of this snow mountain. And my machine gun position was the leftmost dugout on the left side of the 106 Infantry Division before the Second Infantry Division. I think it was north of us. And there was an open stretch across there that a patrol went alternately half hour. And uh, when the Germans hit us. They didn't hit us directly on, they surrounded us. That's how they captured 60. We were setting up on a knob in the middle of the world, and they went around the knob, and that was it. <laughs> okay. Okay, that, that's a way to describe it. Yeah, there's no way out. That's the Eiffel <clears throat> that's, that's the most photogenic, uh, wonder, it's a fantastic place, the Eiffel region, you know. It just makes your mouth, I, I'd like to go back again. <laughs> but it's beautiful country. You go over there now and you wonder how a war happened. I'm sure you could go to where you were right, and right. the same thing. Very, very similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see how, how magnificent the countryside is and what, what people oh, do to tear it up. Yeah. And uh, then I hear stories uh, I hear stories from my German wife, what happened to her and her family. And, uh, they, didn't live a, they didn't live a good life. Either. Nobody lives a good life in a war, let's put it that way. That's for sure. Yeah.